You're listening to the Music Tech Teacher Podcast, episode number 25. Welcome to the Music Tech Teacher Podcast. Music tech tips, lesson ideas, advice, news and interviews, especially for music teachers. Brought to you by midnightmusic.com.au Hello and welcome to another episode of the Music Tech Teacher Podcast. I'm your host Katie Wardrobe from midnightmusic.com.au, the place for music teachers to get the help they need using technology in music education. It's also the home of the Midnight Music community where you can find music tech online courses, video tutorials, tips and personalised support. For more information about the community and a special offer for podcast listeners, go to midnightmusic.com com.au forward slash podcast offer. This episode's guest is Richard McCready, who is using music technology to help teenagers find identity through a range of creative projects. I hope you enjoy my chat with Richard. I had a great time talking to him and we could have probably talked for another hour or two, but we'll save that up for a future episode. So here's my talk with Richard. Today I'm joined by Richard McCready. Richard was born in Ireland but moved to the US in the early 1990s where he's been teaching ever since. With a background in music and computer science, he decided to study music performance at college but also ended up taking electronic music courses. When he moved into music teaching, he incorporated technology into his classes and he currently runs the music tech program at River Hill High School in Columbia, Maryland. Richard is the author of Making Music with Garage Band and Mixcraft and Make Your Own Music. And he's also the series editor of the Prestissimo series of Technology Guides for Teachers, which is published by Oxford. He was also named the teacher, the time teacher, I should say, of the year in 2013. Richard's still getting over the disappointment of missing out on selection for the school cricket team despite having bowled a hat trick. So welcome, Richard. Well, thank you so much. It's lovely to hear your voice. Thank you for having me on the podcast. You're welcome. And so what happened with the school cricket team? That's craziness. Oh, well, I I, I bowled a hat trick. I I took two wickets bowled and one was caught behind. And uh, every time I turned around to the umpire to say, I was looking looking towards the coach as well, but he wasn't interested. I think he already picked the team. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I think he decided who his frontline bowlers were and was, and he didn't need another leg spinner. So I, I just got left behind. I never, I never got onto the team. And you never got over it by the sounds, because that was ha- how many never, years ago now? <laughs> I have never got over that. That would be oh, it's thirty-four years ago. <laughs> <laughs> All those little things. There's often something, you know, remarkable that happens at high school, I think, that you just never forget. And I always like to try and think of the good things, but obviously that was not a great well, memory. <laughs> It probably wasn't good that I was run out for a duck as well early on in the batting trials. Ah, so there's more to the story. That's it. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I discovered quickly that the other wicket is far further away than it looks on the television. I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, th- I think um, I find that with watching tennis too. You know, when you're watching tennis yeah. and you get that view, it's sort of almost a top-down view, like a drone view of the, the court. And, yeah, when you're sitting there watching live and next to the yeah. court, it's a lot further than you think. My, my advice is never to attempt to run when you knock the ball straight to mid on. <laughs> Bad idea. Oh. <laughs> and tell us about the school where you're teaching. So River Hill High School, have you, how long have you been teaching there now? I've been there nine years now. Excellent. So we're, we're coming up on a decade. This will be our, our celebration of a decade. We have, uh, we have T-shirts, which we give the kids, which say River Hill Music Technology, oscillating since 20s, uh, since 2007. Oh, I love so it. 17 coming up. So uh, it's going to be wonderful. Yeah, it's, it's a beautiful program. I usually have three or four classes every year of music technology, uh, depending on the numbers. And I have 25 kids in each class. Excellent. Uh, and so I then complement that with guitar class. I teach advanced guitar as well. Yeah, uh, it's funny break. you met, it's funny you mentioned the guitar because I I thought because of what I see from you on Facebook and you know Twitter and stuff you know there's a lot of guitar related things so I thought guitar was your primary instrument but then I read you know in preparing for this I read that you're actually a tuba performer like that was your main instrument is that correct Tuba was my instrument that I went to college on and I had no idea I feel like I didn't know, I don't know you <laughs> <laughs> well 
Well, I did, I did a degree in Cuba, then I did a master's in Cuba, and then I did a master's in voice. Wow. And uh, when I started, I, I had played the guitar as a kid, and uh, I had stopped. I, I had reached this point where I thought I'm not going to get any better. And uh, so I didn't play again until I got a, a, t a job teaching middle school 15 years ago. And I went out and I bought another guitar and started to play again and just really grew to love it. Yeah. And of course, I, I got past the point at which I'd had problems before. And I, of course, said, well, I'm never going to let any of my students come up with such a pathetic excuse for stopping to play the guitar. Oh, I love hearing you say that because uh, th that's often what I find, you know, and you would have this have had this experience too with technology. I, you know, for people who are resistant to it, like teachers, there's an often yeah. a sense of I'm too old to learn this, you know, something oh. new. And, and I always say to them, so what would you say to someone else who wants to take up an instrument now at, at a later stage in their life, you know, like in their adulthood? And, and of course, as a music teacher, you would never say to someone else, oh, it's too late, like forget it. You know? <laughs> and so of I think not. the same, you know, you've got to turn that around with technology and say, well, it's just something new to learn. And it, it can be exciting. It's frustrating, of course, at times, but, but super exciting. And yeah, that's great. That's really good. Well, I, think, I think the important, the enjoyment is so much more than the executive skill. Yeah, absolutely. And you get to the point where you've got enough knowledge to be able to sit in with a band, to yeah. be able to go to jam, to be able to play something in church, just to be able to join in. And I mean, you probably, I, I'm going to give away my age here, but I remember being you know, a kid and playing along with the record and thinking, my gosh, I'm in tune with the band. This is great. I'm actually playing along. And what a beautiful feeling that was. Yeah. And we can, we can give that to all musicians. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, all people and to say, you, you know, just you, you go at your own level and you go at the level which you enjoy doing. And we, we do that with technology as well. You know, I mean, the technology is actually getting more and more user friendly and easier to use and easier to work out. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, so th there's absolutely no reason to be intimidated by music technology, just as there's no reason to be intimidated by an instrument. And, and uh, one aspect of technology, which is almost, well, it, it's a benefit, I think, is that you can use technology and not have it out to the open until you're ready. Do you know what I mean? Like you can create so, something and you can have your headphones on, whereas with an instrument, people around you are going to hear you fumbling and learning and making mistakes. And that's not a bad thing. But with technology, no, it's it, even easier. You know, you don't have to worry so it's much. The same, it's the same joy as doing a piece of needlepoint, which you then hang up in your own kitchen. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You can a piece of music at home and you can have people that come to your home, listen to it and say, hey, this is something I did. You don't have to put your stuff up on YouTube or SoundCloud. <laughs> It, 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 it can be a very personal, wonderful thing. But so many people now are looking for ways to be creative. Yes. Yep. Really, they're, they're searching. I don't know if you have these uh, things in Australia, which we have in America right now, which is these wine and paint evenings. No, I have not heard of that. No. What is that? Yeah. Well, people go out to these classes and they have a few glasses of wine and they have paint and they have canvas and they all paint. And they come home with a beautiful canvas. And they're taught how to paint this. I mean, it's it's a little bit color by numbers in that everybody paints the same thing, um, but they love it. People absolutely love it. And you see all these uh, pictures of people on Facebook holding up their canvas, oh, having gone brilliant. through these paint evenings, and people love it. We've got places here where people can go and just do pottery. You are you know given some clay and taught how to how to mold it and then how to glaze it and then a couple you know a couple of days later you go back and you get your your thing and i mean it's a great thing for for parties and stuff like that people have parties at the clay store that's and so they cool. go make things. yeah people that's are great thing for creative things you know Colouring in books are so huge oh, right now. Massive. They're, they're, they've been massive everywhere, haven't they? And I think that's yep. true with the music tech stuff, you know, with composition. Yep. You know, I'm often uh, giving kind of not, not limita limitations or structure to a project which I'm doing or showing in workshops. And, you know, we talk about using a specific maybe a, a scale or a set of chords or something. And it, it just becomes much easier st as a starting point than with a blank, totally blank canvas where you just go make something. You know, you give people a few, uh, bit of, a bit of structure and it becomes a much easier process to do something creative. And then, of course, they can take it from there and develop it further. So I'm, I'm guessing the painting thing would be like that too. 
Yeah, and, and you know, teachers need to create first before they go and teach it. Anybody that's intimidated by teaching music technology needs to take time to create and yeah. to feel joy and yeah. just to get into the program, whether that be GarageBand or Ableton or whatever it is, or, or if they're doing it in Sibelius or a, or a notation um, uh, app or something, they just need to take the time to really enjoy that. Yeah, it's really important to do the project yourself first and I've always done that myself and I, my friend James Humberstone has done a whole yes. uh, keynote talk on that subject. I think I think basically his mantra throughout that was do the project yourself first and it becomes really important because you not only get to create something yourself and feel proud of it but you also find the pitfalls along the way that might trip your students up and you can warn them ahead of time and all of those things are good and it actually makes me think, you know, I, I remember I remember looking at your website, which I'll, we'll link to in the show notes, but you've got a website where your student portfolios are and it's fantastic because you can see all the projects that you've assigned them over the time and they've got examples of their work up there and feedback and I'd like to talk a bit more about that afterwards, but, but you've got yourself up there too and you've done the projects and you have your own examples, which I thought was really great. Yeah, uh, thank you for noticing that. Uh, I do make my own portfolio at the same time to show that I am a musician. And the, the portfolio is an exercise in finding our identity as musicians. And when I talk about finding identity as a musician, I come up with my own stories of where I got to, to this elevated place in my life. Um, the, the stuff that I listened to as a teenager, the stuff that I link to, the stuff that made me appreciate music and appreciate making music and so at the same time as students are creating their portfolios I create mine. Yeah I really love that and I, I loved the fact that you have them not only do they share the work of the assignments that you've you know set for them they talk about it which I think is really interesting their thought process behind you know what they did and the choices they made I laughed because um, one of the ones I read he said I was in a bad mood that day and so I decided to add some fun into it and you know he added some funny sound effects into this project yeah. I can't remember which one it was but I, I thought that was really funny is that the goat in the yes, chariots that's it yeah the goats yeah. Yeah. it was a, a chariots of fire remix was it is that is that right that's right from memory yeah that's right yeah, yeah and he, he discovered the sampler uh, in Ableton quite by accident. I hadn't told them about that, but he discovered it. And then the next thing is he got, he got some goats and started playing. And he just sat there and laughed and laughed and laughed. And then he decided, I'm going to record this. <laughs> I love it. I love the so, honesty, I, you know. It's good. Yeah, I, I build my portfolio at the same rate as them. Oh, good. I was going to ask you that. I, th I wondered if you had done yours ahead of time as examples um, or whether you were doing it at the same time. So that's really good. No, that's but what I want to do with the kids is, you know, I'll tell them that everything is a voyage of discovery. And we use, you know, Weebly, which is a fairly simple WYSIWYG editor. But I'll say to them, you know, there's new things which they might have added since I last did a portfolio. Oh, uh, there might be things in a different place, so it, it's ridiculous for me just to tell you where to do things, but I'm going to do it at the same time, so I'm going to learn at the same time. So I'll come in and I'll tell them what stage I'm up to with my process. Maybe I've got my biography done. Maybe I've got a page of my influences. Maybe I've started a page of putting up my own compositions. And uh, so that they can kind of go along with me at the same rate. Uh, I do the same with all projects in school. I will do a project before I teach it, even if I've taught it the same project three or four times. Yep, I do the same thing because <laughs> things change or you back, forget. <laughs> I will go back to the drawing board. I will start it again and I will do one at home. And then with each of my classes, I will create that project, another project, something new at the same rate as they're doing. Yeah, right. And so even when they're working, when I set them off to work and I say, you know, you've got half an hour to work on that, I'll sit down at my desk and I'll work at mine. I can do things faster than them, so I can do the task within 10 minutes and then I'm available to go around and help them. But I'm actually sitting down and making sure I'm at that point. And I will have on my desktop um, a project for period two, a project for period four, and a project for period six. And each of those then I'm building on every class. If period four comes in, I open where I'm up to with period four and I show the next point and I work on that so I'm ready for the next day when that comes in. But I don't use the same project for all three classes. Oh, that's so fascinating. Right. Wow, that's yeah. great. It's fun to see that happen and it refreshes me all the time. 
uh, and it also shows the kids that the creative process is important. Yeah, absolutely. And and so just tell us, where what are the ages of students that you're working with? My students are anywhere from 15 to 18 years old. Uh-huh. Yeah, okay, cool. And tell us about the projects that they're doing. So the obviously, I mean, they're setting up the website, the portfolio itself. So you mentioned you use Weebly, um, which mm-hmm. is a free website, you know, that people can just sign up for and use. And they've got some beautiful templates. So you instantly get something that looks really nice and it's not hard to use. And it's um, they've made some changes recently and they're more mobile friendly and, you know, all of those other things. So I, I think it's a really great option for digital portfolios for students students because it teaches them that that publishing out to the world thing if if you're working with students that are old enough to do that and, and to share their work online and it's such a great thing to have it out in the public it gives it a bit more meaning I think or, or weight or gravity <laughs> so what I want is for them to to show with their portfolio who they are mm-hmm. that they are discovering through music their identity as a teenager every teenager wants to discover their identity um, at the age of 11 all us teenagers are listening to exactly the same band. I'm sure you and your school were listening to this exactly the same band as all your girlfriends and boyfriends yep. at the age of 11. And at the age of 15, 16, you start to discover your own way. And you start to really identify with a certain uh, population. And you might see that through a certain artist that identifies there. And so with their portfolio, what they're doing is they're building a picture of who they are. And with each composition, the compositions are influenced by they who, by they are as a musician. I, they're kind of finding their own lane, you know. They're 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 driving their own car, and look, this is your lane. This is somebody else's lane. This is Teddy's lane. This is Josie's lane. But this is your lane, and you're putting yourself there, so that even though people are working on a similar project, it identifies with who they are because their influences are coming into that. And when they write about their project, what I want them to talk about is the process they went through and what they learned. That they should be able to show that they are capable of understanding their own learning, which I think is the most important piece of that portfolio. So that when they are able to then send that into a college for possible entrance, not only for a music program, but for any program to show that they are creative, if they understand the metacognitive piece of how they actually learn and what they do, how that feeds their learning, I think that's going to be very attractive to a university. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it, it like you said, it it's, it goes beyond just music as a, a topic or a subject and right. those skills can be applied across the board really with anything. Yeah. I, l- I'll send, I send four students out a year possibly to do music technology mm-hmm. as in a four-year institution yet I teach 100 to 125 every year. And I'm not foolish like a band teacher who worries about why a, you know, a trumpet kid is not going to play the trumpet after high school. That, that's not where my focus is. My focus is that I'm creating a creative person and I'm creating a musician that will be able to make music all their life. Yeah, and, and, and get the enjoyment from it and share, share stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so any of the projects which we do, we actually start by them finding their own identity. Uh, you know, I, I throw them into GarageBand early on, and I said, you know, if you, if you like heavy metal, find me as many heavy metal loops as you can. Find me as many, many cool drum loops as you can, and then I show them how to change those so that they get more into the sounds that they like. i got a lot of kids, of course, who are into trap, so I'll show them how to take a drum beat and make it into trap. We can take something country and we can turn it into a trap beat. And they love this. And they love the idea of being able to take things and put them into their own style. And that gets us into exploring um, you know, how to create beats, how to use effects, and, and, and how to mix. And gradually, as they go through their first year with me, they will do sorts of projects where they're creating podcasts of their favorite artists. They create a, they narrate a children's book and they compose their own music for it and add sound effects and they add voices, which allows them to experiment, of course, with changing pitches and adding filters and all those sorts of things. I love that as a project. I've, I've done that a bit too. And it's such a great accessible thing to do. It's a really good, easy way to get into editing of audio and, you know, experimenting yeah. with those effects and, and that sort of thing. Yeah, I, I, I do some things which are, which are straight composition, uh, where we take... Uh, we'll pull a composition down into four component parts. 
which are beat, bass line, chords, and melody. And we'll find out how to put melodies with, with beats and how to put chords with things and how to put those four things together. I don't teach that there is an order to them. I teach that we need all four components and we've got to throw them in the mixing bowl somehow and we get from one to the other. That's interesting uh, because, yeah, I've, I've had a discussion before with a couple of people about which of those things do you do first. And, you know, for me, it, it really varies. Sometimes you just start with the drum pattern for some reason and then and then add other things. And then other times it might be a chord sequence or maybe a melody and, and it really makes no difference. But I think some people have a consistent approach, don't they? They tend to always start with melody or always chords. I've, I've always found it changes from artist to artist. Yeah. Uh, what I did, I mean, at first I thought, you know, what is the order? That, you know, I, I, from being a studio musician, I thought, okay, I always record drums first. Yeah, me too, with, with that sort of thing I do too. <laughs> and so I started doing composition that way, and then I thought, well, wait a second, does everybody necessarily do that? Yeah. And then I thought, probably not. And I thought, you know, what does Paul McCartney do? Paul McCartney thinks harmonically first. Yeah. And melodically. And what does Dylan do? Well, Dylan teach, thinks lyrically first. Oh, I know. And, and That's such a big thing, isn't it? I, I, I may have mentioned on another episode, I, you know, I have this thing where me and my own kids, we listen to songs, we take turns in choosing songs on our car trips each time. So there's three of us, my two boys and me, and we rotate, you know, each of us having a choice. And um, my eldest particularly is very much into hip hop and rap at the moment. And his thing that he notices the most are the lyrics, you know, and, and I said, to, I made the mistake of saying to the other day, you know, that uh, we were listening to an Eminem song and I said, man, this is just really repetitive. And he looked at me, he's like, how can you say that? <laughs> and then I realized we were talking about two different things. I was listening to the bass line, which had one single note for three minutes. And <laughs> he, he was listening to the lyrics and he's like, there's hardly any repetition, mum. How right. can you say that? <laughs> well, the point of entry is different from every single musician. And that's what I see, that w when we look at a piece of music, we can't teach somebody else to say, well, my method is what works for you. Mm. Uh, you know, I saw Paul Simon a few weeks ago. Oh, and he actually, really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How did you was, manage that? Wow, at a concert? It, yeah, he was playing locally here. Oh. And uh, I, got, I got tickets for my wife and myself. And Seriously. It, it was amazing. <laughs> but he, he spoke at one point about how when he was younger, he would always start by just trying to find a riff on a guitar. Yeah. And the song came from an initial riff, and he'd sit there for hours just trying to find that, that golden moment. And then when he went off to South Africa, everything starts with finding rhythm first. Oh, right. And his approach to, to writing has changed. That doesn't mean that he can't sit down and just honk out a riff and create a song around that, but he's able to alter his songwriting method and his compositional method according to his age, where he is, his place in his life, and, and, and what he wants to do. And so, you know, instead of, you know, taking this back to my classroom, instead of compositions being prescriptive about, you know, today we're going to write a drum beat, tomorrow we're going to write a bass line, the next day we're going to write chords, it's more or less that we have experimentation about how those things all work. And then when the compositional element starts, you say, okay, now we're going to try to put these things together. It's kind of like, you know, um, doing your own sous chefing before you cook. Yeah, yeah. All your stuff so it's out there. And then you've prepared everything, you've marinated everything, you've chopped everything, you've done what you need to. And then the final cooking process is just putting that all together. Yeah, I like that. And I like that a lot. Do you have yes. students save elements into, say, the loop library of whichever program they're using? Like, in, I mean, Ableton Live's kind of set up like, yeah. um, you know, you can set up small sketches or loops or little Absolutely. snippets of music and, and it makes that approach really easy. Right, in GarageBand and Logic, you would drag stuff into your loop library and, and do it that way and then, then uh, use them back into your composition. <laughs> Right, except that particular functionality is blocked by our computing and network services. No, seriously? In in which one? In Logic GarageBand or? In GarageBand. Oh, yeah. no. It That's the one of the things I love about GarageBand. So not all of the programs allow you to save stuff into their library. And I think I think That's it's a great approach, setting up small snippets of ideas and then absolutely. borrowing but them back. You know? <laughs> but because it's part of the shared library, oh, if they no. try to add every, anything... If we try to import loops or anything, we got, you need an administrator's name and password. Oh, no. 
But Ableton makes it so much easier. Oh yeah. my gosh. So you can do Ableton. that with Ab- when your students are using Ableton. Yeah. Ableton's a pirate's dream. <laughs> <laughs> Ableton allows us to do so much. And uh, we, we can actually, uh, don't, don't call the network police, but we've managed to find a lot of workarounds with Pro Tools as well. So they don't, <laughs> they don't know where we're installing plugins. <laughs> And so I, um, I'm, I'm going to guess that you let students use whichever tool they use. Is that right? Software program wise. I mean, do they do they get to choose, or do you sort of direct them towards um, Ableton Live, for instance, for some things, or do they have the freedom I, to do whatever? I get them started with GarageBand so that they can start to understand signal flow. Mm -hmm. I want them to understand basic mixing. I want them to understand volume levels, panning. I want them to understand EQ and compression. Mm -hmm. Those things I get in, and I want them to understand the concept of tracks. I want them to understand the concept of a digital audio workstation, Uh, muting and soloing, all those things I can get in GarageBand. And then I will move on to Ableton Live, and uh, we can get much more... um, we can get more advanced composition mm. with a, and then with my advanced class, I'll then bring them into Pro Tools, and uh, they will get to the stage where they will select a particular um, project, and they will decide themselves what digital audio workstation to use. I have a number of them that have Logic at home. Uh, Logic seems to be very popular. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are kids at home, and some that have FL Studio. Uh, and some that have, you know, Cubase and, and those sorts of things. I also point them towards online digital audio workstations. You know, if yeah, I, I teach them, I said, you know, what you, you you may learn to drive in a Chevy, but if I give you a Mini, you can be able to drive it. Yeah. Uh, and I, you know, I said you should be. You know, I give them one project where I just say www.soundtrap.com. Go for it. Yeah. <laughs> You are not allowed to ask me how it works. You are not allowed to look up any videos. You're not allowed to Google anything. And they just get into it. And a day later, they got a composition all done in Soundtrap. They work it out themselves because yeah. once you once you learn to drive one, you learn to drive them all. Oh, I agree. I, I say that all the time. Some teachers come to me and they're, they're stressed or worried because their school's about to switch over, say, from PCs to Macs or vice versa, or, or they're going to um, online software only. And I, I always say, you know, have you have you been using something in the past? Like, have you used GarageBand if you've had Macs in the past? And I said, well, it's okay because all of them work really in the same way. I mean, give or take right. features and stuff, but they really work the same way. And once you know the terminology particularly, if you kind of generalise the terminology or know variations on terms for things like the playhead is sometimes called the cursor and so on or the playback line if you're a bit more notation you know <laughs> wise you know. and if you know that then you can look for uh, all of those terms any of those terms if you if you know what panning is or that it's going to be under automation then you know right. that you're just going to look up automation somewhere and it's probably on the track header you know so Absolutely. yeah I, I agree. Yeah. It's it's a it's a case of learning everything, and you know it's the same as switching from Microsoft Word to Pages to Google Docs. Well, I, it's all the I, same, you know. It it is all the same, and my students will choose the appropriate tool for what they want to do. Yeah, I like that because that's a real world, you know, situation. Once uh, they've left school, really, they're going to just use whatever they have. So that's a great approach. I have several projects which end up, you know, going through two digital audio workstations before they're done. Yeah, right. They will they will use one for tracking. They'll use a different one for mixing. Oh, that's uh, so interesting. They're, they're quite sensible about recognizing what strengths certain digital audio workstations have and the comfort they have with certain digital audio workstations. Yeah, yeah. I often combine things too. You know, Audacity I love, for instance, for its... <laughs> precision of editing a waveform <laughs> and it's so much right. easier I find to do that than in GarageBand as an example and oh, so I will do stuff in Audacity and then I will move it across to GarageBand or some other you know software and and do yeah. further work on it there but yeah I agree it's about using the right tool for the job and so it's like your kitchen analogy of switching knives for different jobs or yeah. saucepans it's or something. Also, you don't drive your mini in the mountains you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Certainly not it's an automatic. Um, you know, <laughs> Can you... Can you describe some of the, the projects that you do with the students? You mentioned, say, the, you know, narrating a children's book and, and the stuff you do with that, but what are some of the other things that you've been doing? I, well, I really, I choose my projects according to my class mm-hmm. and what I see that they want to do. 
but uh, there's things like we will do, um, we'll take a scene from a movie and we'll recreate a new piece of music. Uh, one of my favorites is to take The Day the Earth Stood Still and to research about the theremin and to research about early analog synthesis and then only allow them analog synthesis uh, with lots of glides and stuff to create a new soundtrack for something. Excellent. And I like this. There's one I did this year, which I really liked, called Colors, where I went back to an album by Ken Nordine, which is a, 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 a 60s beat album of word poetry. Uh, in which he just takes uh, a color and talks about the quality of that color. And then he has a little jazz quartet in the background that makes this abstract music that goes with it. So we, we choose our own colors and then we create a poem around what that color means and we create music uh, to go with the effect of that, of that color. Oh, that's great. That, that appeals to me a lot because I'm a, obsessed, a little bit obsessed with color. <laughs> my, my kids really dig it. And one of them... One of my students this year, he went to the paint store and got one of those huge color wheels. Oh, um, yes. Oh, awesome. It was awesome. And all the kids were just checking it every day to find out what cool colors they could use. One of my and, favorite uh, things in the paint shop is, you know, the place where you can get all those strips of color samples. And I just love looking at them, but they always look a bit wrong under the light of the, the store. You know, the store light is never very good. And so you've got to kind of take them outside to check them properly. <laughs> Of course. Oh, I love that. That sounds fabulous. Yeah. Yeah, it's a it, it's a lot of fun. Um, I have a one where they uh, create an imaginary video game, and they have to create the music for the video game, uh, and that video game then has to go through different levels or worlds or time zones or atmospheres, and so they have to present variation to the music and then they have to create a PowerPoint or a keynote in which they have to sell that video game to a company. Wow. And that's involved. They, they, they must describe the entire video game, their concept for the video game, and to go with that must be the music that we hear because that's going to give the people you're selling to the atmosphere of, of your game. Excellent. So the um, PowerPoint is showing just still images, um, obviously, of the of what they're imagining the game to be. It's not actually showing footage as such? No, it's not. Though I, I have had a couple that have created their own footage through animation, which has been wonderful. Awesome. Those, of course they have. I love that. The they will create, the, you know, some actual scenes from a video game. Yeah. I don't know if you've but something odd about our current generation is that they watch other people play video games on YouTube. I know. My, my kids are obsessed with it. But I think that's true of everything, not just video games. They like watching other people do almost anything. It's really bizarre. And did you see, um, we recently had on our Australian 60 Minutes program, we had an article about uh, professional gamers, essentially. And they showed the first scene of this news article was a big stadium, massive stadium, like sports stadium, with all these people watching huge, enormous screens. And it was of the pro gamers playing whatever game it was. And it was like, it was like a massive sports match. It was insane. It was just crazy. Wow. Well. It, it, I, we begin to show our age, don't we? Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> yeah. The kids, my yeah. kids, are like, and <laughs> so <laughs> it's just so mind blowing, mind blowing. I love to take existent music and allow kids to remix. Yeah, I do too. I, I, I struggle only from the fact that I really try very hard to be squeaky clean with all of that and it's um, it's a harder thing just, you know, not being free to take anything at any time. And I have really mixed feelings about it because, you know, I, I like to teach being, you know, uh, what do you call it, um, responsible with, you know, d yeah. use of digital materials of other people's and, and using stuff which you have been given permission up front, like Creative Commons licensed or public domain. And <laughs> there's quite a bit of stuff you can find, but there's some areas which are harder to find what you want to use. And I mean, you and I and um, Barb Friedman, who's, you know, been on the show before, you know, we, we share <laughs> remix stems. <laughs> Here's our little thing, you know, once one of us finds a set of remix stems, we, we basically share it with each other in a Dropbox folder. And, and it's so useful because those are yeah. really hard to come across. I mean, you, you can find them occasionally and I like finding the ones that have come up for a competition, you know, remix competition. So they've been legally made available and then I feel quite fine about using them in workshops 
thoughts or sharing them with other people, but I'm not so keen on sharing ones that have just been passed around on the internet. There's sort of mysterious underworld of, of remix sharing, you know, remix stem sharing out there. And, you know, you can find some great stuff, but I'm always like, oh, where's that come from though? I don't know. It is a little dubious, but what, I, what I've learned to do is to actually use the word remix for even more than we might presume it means in the music tech world. Mm. Uh, for example, you mentioned uh, Chariots of Fire Remix. Yes. Uh, what that project was, the kids actually learned to play Chariots of Fire. So I gave them the notation for it. Yeah, yeah. And we watched the movie. We talked about um, Van Gallis and his improvisation, stuff like that. And I said, what you need to do is record Chariots of Fire. And so they actually learned to play it. And then, you know, they created their own beats and they created their own bass line and put the chords in and all those things. And they called it a remix. Yeah. And it's but more of a cover, not, really, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. it is. Yeah. And they can, they can, we can use that word remix for everything. I mean, I really started to learn from the kids. Yeah. And, you know, the years ago, they would come in and say, you know, yo, is this where I get to make beats? Yeah. <laughs> and I, I would be offended. I would be, uh, you know, that, that's, that's a real oversimplification of what I do. And then after a while, I realized they just that that just meant to them is this where we get to make music? Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's, that's their terminology. That's, yeah, this is where we get to make beats. And now they come in and say, you know, is this where we get to do a drop a mixtape? I'm like, you bet. <laughs> which is Even which is from have, our childhood, our terminology. Right. They don't know what a tape is, but they still say, I'm going to drop a mixtape, and that means they're going to create music. <laughs> is that, so what are they referring to when they say that sentence to you that, that they want to make are they talking about a collection of songs or are they what are they talking oh, about there it, they're saying i want to make music <laughs> oh, that's awesome <laughs> it's just that the common the, the fun term i mean it was up until recently the good term for music was a beat yeah i create well you, you mean when i was at college and probably you were at college if somebody said you know i've written a song and there was no vocals in it we were like it's not a song yeah no, i i have that now, argument with a couple of people we've had to mellow to that and totally say, you know, you, oh yeah i like your song yeah and now i got to the point where we've met a kid said you know will bring me a composition he said would you listen to my beat yeah and i'll listen to the thing and i evaluate it as a composition yeah. now if a kid says i've done a mixtape he means I've written a piece of music. Hilarious. I have not heard that. Wow, I'm not yeah. hanging around with the right people. Wow, that's so funny. And I, I've also let things go as well. Um, in the, you know, in the remix STEM world, I, I kind of used to laugh about the fact that um, an, an unaccompanied vocal STEM, i.e. just the vocals on their own without anything in the background, is called an a cappella. Or a pell, yeah. pell for short. <laughs> so in some uh, websites, you go to the menu, which is called Pells, and that means that you're going to the place where there are vocal tracks without any accompaniment with them. I, I, was, I was up in Minnesota last week, and, and somebody talked about, asked one of the kids, do you have bars? What? And I thought he was, he said, do you have bars? And I thought he was asking about the nightlife in Clarksville. <laughs> Apparently now the term bars means tabs? a repertoire of quality compositions. What? If you've got bars, yeah, bars is your set of compositions that you can pull from that you've got. I have never heard that. Wow. I would yes. not have even guessed that one. Oh. Yeah, this is now, yeah, you've got bars means you've 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 got a you've got an EP of good songs. Wow. You've got I know, it's amazing. That's hilarious. And I, I actually laugh still about the fact that, like, the terminology of EP is still used. You know, you go to Spotify and someone's released an EP and it's like yeah. there's no, like, uh, physical vinyl record which just has no. five tracks on it. It just happens to be a small collection of digital music which is being released as a, a thing, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's really funny, isn't it? Yeah, and the Beats yeah. one. It took me a while to realise that, that beats encompassed a lot of things, you know, and, and beats for me in the past, you know, I would have thought years ago that that was just rhythmic stuff like you were saying, but but really it's, you know, it might be a riff. It's actually a riff or, a, you know, a little keyboard figure that has a backing of, you know, some drums with it and, and that's the beat. And, yeah, you've just got to really uh, recategorise things in your mind as a music teacher, I think, because that's what the students are. You can't be correcting them and saying, you know, they're, they're no. being incorrect because that's just futile, I think. <laughs> you've got to kind of go oh, over yeah. there. Yeah, you don't that's take that. That's fascinating. Back. Okay, I've learnt two new things today at least. <laughs> Bars and what was the other one? Uh, can't remember Well, you now. talk 
Bounce, but yeah, oh, mixtape. Mixtape, yeah, the mixtape term. No, I've never heard that being used in that way. Wow, that's great. That's really cool. This episode of the Music Tech Teacher Podcast is brought to you by the Midnight Music Community. The Midnight Music Community is an online space for music teachers who'd like help using technology in their music lessons. There are online courses, video tutorials, lesson plans, music tech news, and professional development certificates are provided for any training that you undertake. I'm inside the community every day, personally answering members' questions and sharing tips and ideas. The best thing is that you get to connect with hundreds of other music teachers just like you and share your own experiences and occasional music tech frustrations. For more information and a special joining price just for the listeners of this podcast, visit midnightmusic.com.au forward slash podcast offer. That's midnightmusic.com.au forward slash podcast offer. What is the favourite project of your students, would you say? As a group, do they have a favourite that they all love or is it varied depending on their taste and style? Well, it, it can certainly vary. Uh, when, I, when I take evaluations in at the end of the year, it certainly seems that they really love one I do, which is the Lego breakdance video. Oh, really? Tell, me, have tell a, me about that. It's a stop frame animation of some Legos, and they are at a breakdance tournament. Yeah, cool. I think I've seen that, actually. And I think it might yeah. even be available on the Internet Archive website. Oh, it's, archive, it's archive.org. Yeah, archive.org. Uh, Excellent. Okay, I'll put a link I, to that. I rip out the original audio. Yep. Which it, we, we actually listen to it first, and we discover what's wrong with it. You know, it's distorted. The music is is anachronistic because it doesn't belong. If you, there's no way people would break dance to, to, to a Gary Glitter tune. <laughs> it's, it's all wrong, and it also doesn't tell the story. There's quite clearly a story because these people are at a park jam, and you see different figures come out, and you see one which is a set of, like, stormtroopers from, uh, or paratroopers, I don't know what it is, from Star Wars stormtroopers. And then eventually there is a, a police car that comes across and drives straight through the middle of the, uh, the jam and knocks one of the guys over. <sighs> the actual original soundtrack doesn't tell the story at all. But when you allow the kids to tell the story and to, to see that there are different characters and different styles and say, you know, part of animation, half of animation is sound because you're bringing something to life. Mm. And the, the video on its own will not do it. So they have to go to the next level and then bring that to life, including sound effects for all the crowd cheering and the applause between each break dancer and the uh, the police car at the end. Or some of them do it as an ice cream van because that's a bit more fun. <laughs> and, 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 of course, things are moving around the stage, so you have to use panning all the time. You have to use volume to th bring things front and back. And they all the time they say that this is the first time I really got to make my own music because they were creating their own drum beats and adding things to it and in sections so that there's quite a lot of individual sections which they're making uh, even within a two and a half minute video and so they really think that this is the first time they have complete carte blanche to do what they want yeah that's when right it, when in actual fact the guidelines are quite quite strict because if they don't tell that story then they're not going to succeed yeah but they love to be able to tell that story. Uh, you know, I know that, um, you know, as humans, we love to tell stories. And one of the reasons we write so many songs is because we're telling stories. Why hip hop is so important is because we're telling stories. Why bluegrass is so important, folk, rock and roll, all of these are telling stories. And for them, they're able to tell that story through music in their own way. Yeah, that's and, brilliant. And it's huge to them. That's another reason they also like the, uh, the, the children's book, to narrate a children's book because they can choose a story from their own childhood. If they want to ask their mom to find a book up in the attic and bring it in, they can do that. And then some of them will actually do this, do the story and then they will make a CD and they will send it to a, a cousin or a younger brother or something like that. I always try to do that one in December so they have it for, uh, for, for, for the Christmas. holidays and stuff. Yeah, great, great yeah. project. Really great and project. They also love the video game project because they get to tell a story with the game. Mm. 
and ultimately a lot of video games which they are using are stories. Um, and when we look at examples of them, we look at things like Mario. Of course, you can't get away from Mario in no. the world of it. <laughs> and we talk about that story that's there and how much that is just always a retelling of the story of finding the princess and tackling Bowser and those things. We always look at Sonic and we say, what is the story there? We look at Final Fantasy, which is one of the great ones in terms of um, of creating music. Uh, Nobuo Uematsu did extraordinary work with Final Fantasy. And again, all the time it's telling a story. So, you know, I, I think a lot of them want to be able to tell their story. There's, you know, humans want to tell stories. And if we can introduce to them that they can do that through music, they really link into that and they love to do that. And I think um, it, it makes me just think back to their portfolios that you get them to do on, you know, the Weebly uh, website. I really love the fact that they, obviously you've asked them to list their musical influences and there's a special page for that and they have a collection of, you know, musicians or artists or you know, albums, whatever it is, that, that have influenced them. And I was really interested to read some of them because, yes, there are maybe a couple of recent examples, recent artists or, you know, albums, but... Lots of them have things from, you know, decades ago in their list of influences, which I found really interesting, you know, a, a big variety of styles of music and, and artists as well. Yeah. And another thing we do, which they really link into, is where we will take the music that they know and we will research a similar music in a different part of the world. What is the focus and reason for the music that you're listening to? And now let's find that somewhere else which is outside of your vicinity. So one could say, you know, all right, you're into hip hop and you live in Melbourne. Okay, so we're going to talk about the hip hop scene in Melbourne and find out things that are going on. Then on a bigger scale, how does that apply throughout Australia and New Zealand? Maybe mm. let's find out where hip-hop is going around the country and what does that mean for the identity of the Australian? Is there examples, for example, of Aboriginal hip-hop? What does that mean? And, and what is going on there? Is there examples of Maori hip-hop? What does that story mean? And then say, well, what does hip-hop mean in the, in the global sphere? Let's look over at America. Let's see what hip-hop is doing there. And let's see also what hip hop is doing in Africa. Let's see what hip hop is doing in the subcontinent of India and find that ultimately hip hop has many musical things in common, but also has societal things in common. Mm. Find people using music in similar ways outside of your city block. That's an advanced topic. I don't get that in, into that with my, my first year kids, but with my second, third, fourth year kids. That really opens their world, and they start listening to music which is similar, but then could have completely different influenced beats or completely different language or different modalities, and it takes them in a new direction, which is a lot of fun. Yeah, that's great. That's really good. I think it's great to relate it to a wider vicinity than just your immediate experience and to, to get a bit more broad, you know. Yeah. I mean, my kids could get completely stuck. In, in, in thinking just of music within the eastern United States. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> really not a, a healthy worldview to think that you're the only people that are doing a certain type of music or the only people that have these problems or this desire to communicate. Yeah. By the way, since people are listening, if they want to check out the website, riverhillmusictech.com, I'm sure you're going to put that with the uh, with the details with the podcast, but if anybody's listening and wants to click on that. Yeah, I definitely will because you can get a great sense of what the project is that the kids have been set and like we've been talking about, their, you know, their, their feedback about the project from their own point of view and it's got examples of what they've come up with. So it's, it's just a great insight into how they interpreted the assignment and, and what they ended up doing. And tell and us, the, go on. There's a few times a year as well when I will go out to what we call artist teacher institutes, mm -hmm. where we have uh, teachers who are in service teachers, so they're experienced teachers, but they're learning about arts integration. And I will show up with a handful of my kids. In fact, I'm taking three of them out on Wednesday. And, uh, and I, we show up, we make some music, and then they talk about being a creative artist. 
and they always refer back to their portfolios and they always show their portfolios how creativity has altered them. And I usually take a mix of current students and former students. Uh, so on Wednesday, I'm taking one guitarist who's in his last year with me, and then I'm taking a young lady who graduated from me three years ago, but is studying guitar and music technology at college. And then another young man who is uh, studying engineering, I believe, uh, but took music with me, and it's extraordinary. And they're all extraordinary, and they, they are able to speak very, very eloquently and very com confidently about why creative education is important. Uh, I actually, I have to sit on my hands, which is a bit of a problem. Because I love <laughs> and if someone puts me in front of a group of people and says, you know, talk about creative education, well, I'll, I'll, I'll be there till Jesus comes back. <laughs> Jesus will be pushing me off the stage saying, I've got business to do. And, but the kids will go on forever and talk about their creativity. And so it's great that music technology and, and this composition has enabled them to discover that. And to be free that up. I think it really opens it up to, to kids that may not have found that that side of their own creativity before. You know, technology is so accessible to anyone. And, you know, even with just a phone or just an iPad, you can do so much nowadays. I mean, it, it's really great what you've got open to, to you. Even if you don't have, haven't got an instrument or haven't learned an instrument in the past, there's still a lot you can do, I think. Oh, Absolutely. And so just to um, just to finish off, tell us about the books that you've written. I want to make sure that we don't forget to mention those. And I know, I mean, I've got your Making Music with Garage Band and Mixed Craft, which you co-authored. And which side did you, did you, you did the Garage Band ones, is no, that I, correct? I, I, oh, you did the Mixed Craft. <laughs> I knew I'd get I it wrong. <laughs> and so that book, uh, for the people who haven't seen that book, it's a collection, basically a collection of projects that you can do in either Garage Band and Mixed Craft, and there's kind of like alternating chapters on on each one, and you can basically adapt everything in the book for each of the other software programs or any other software program you're using for that matter. Yeah, yeah. The idea there, uh, was Jim Frankel came up with the idea of, of, of having a suite of creative lessons. And initially we said, well, we'll write the same exact lessons in Mixed Craft and Garage Band. I so wondered we... about this, yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Cool. And then as Michael and I, Michael and I did all the lessons in there, as we sat and talked about it, we realized that each of the things that we do is quite easily translatable into the other without us having to spell it out. Mm. Uh, so it would make more sense to write to the – to the real idiosyncratic strengths of each of the softwares. Uh, and then, you know, somebody could go through the book and they could find ideas from there and then apply it. So if somebody has GarageBand, they may look at my lesson on celebrating local music, how to write a podcast about local musicians and music that's going on in your school, and quite easily apply that to uh, to the opposite program. So Robin recorded a series of videos which show the skills uh, in GarageBand and Mixcraft and uh, enable you to, to do those together. So it's, uh, it, it's been a well-received book, and it was a great project to work on. Mike and Robin and Jim are, of course, extraordinary educators, uh, you know, and they inspire me, and it's wonderful to work with those people. Yeah, and, and the, the more recent one is the Make Your Own Music one. That, that was only, was that own, last year that it came out? It just came out last year, yeah. Um, Presonus had a product uh, you could buy called the Music Creation Suite where in the box you got a keyboard and an audio interface and a pair of headphones, uh, cables that you needed, plus uh, Studio One software and Notion software. So you had the notation part and you had the digital audio workstation part. So I decided to write a book. Uh, so that one could teach music technology with a series of projects and a series of skills that use both notation and digital audio workstation and allow you to develop both of those skills. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, so I wrote it as a series of uh, two skills per chapter plus a bonus skill, uh, which goes through eight chapters, uh, getting you up and running with sequencing, getting you up and running with recording, getting you up and running with uh, the virtual instruments, getting you up and running with notation, and moving between the two, of course. Uh, and uh, 
a series of videos that went with that. And I also recorded, uh, in, introduced him to the uh, Steam ideas for every single chapter. Oh, that's so really we, interesting. I haven't read this one yet, so I, I need to get it clearly. <laughs> but the Steam thing is very big at the moment, and that's an area that I'm getting into a lot more now. So there's a section in each chapter where we go into Steam problem solving. Excellent. And we look at one of the problems that existed uh, in the world of music and how notable people came along and solved that problem. And we look at Les Paul, we look at... Uh, we look at um, Tom Dowd. Uh, we look at David Edward Hughes, who invented the microphone. Uh, we look at these sorts of people. And we look at notable moments in the industry, the development of multi-tracking, uh, all those sorts of things, and to, you know the development of music publishing. Um, and so we see uh, a problem solving that has been done through music which really links into, I hope, a lot of cross-curricular ideas for those that choose to adopt the book. Yeah. Um, and you can't get the music creation suite anymore, but the first chapter does basically say what you need. You know, yeah. get a keyboard. Get, you know, the creation suite was amazing because it was one-stop shopping. Yeah, that's right. And, and like we were saying before, I mean, the ideas in that book anyway could be applied to, you know, whichever um, tools that you've got handy and, you know, right. those, those software programs obviously are going to work really well. I honestly think Studio One is one of the best out there and it gets better and better. Yeah, absolutely. We're so spoilt for choice these days, aren't we, with everything, <laughs> doors and notation. It's crazy. There's just so much to choose from now. Right. And, and Notion is a fabulous notation program. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It's cheaper than Sibelius or Finale, and it's incredibly robust and expandable. And uh, it's very easy to use. So I've enjoyed using both of them. And so, and then with Oxford, uh, we're working on a series of uh, books for music technology, for easy guides for teachers. The first one was on digital organization. How to organize your digital library, how to organize all your sheet music, how to organize your calendar, how to organize everything in your band room or your choir room or your classroom, whatever, so that it's all at your finger fingertips with your iPad or your iPhone or your computer. The second one was on recording. Uh, we find a lot of teachers that don't know anything about recording their ensemble. Uh, and they have to hire outside help to record a concert. And they, or they put one microphone up in front of their band and then wonder why it sounds awful. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. you get a lot of one instrument and not much of anyone else. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and so the Recording Tips for Music Educators by Ron Kearns is a very valuable, very easy, quick guide to really correct all the problems, including going into things like, you know, what to do if you're outside and the wind just won't stop blowing or they put you in the gymnasium instead of mm. the... Uh, instead of the auditorium, all those things. And then we're uh, currently working on one on practice room um, tips. So the, the sort of uh, smart music uh, apps that are around, I don't know if in Australia you've still got in the chair, I know that was around for a while, but those sort of uh, packages which allow you to uh, work on your practice, your individual practice, and of course for a teacher to uh, to assign that work and to monitor it and all the wonderful things that you can do with that to track students' progress. And uh, then we have another one that is uh, hopefully going to get started soon about smart boards and smart projectors and the sorts of things that one can do with uh, interactive websites on a big screen. Excellent. This is, sounds great. I'm, I'm going to check this out. I haven't looked at these yet, but uh, they, they sound really practical. That's, you know, often my approach is just, it's the practicalities that people need to know about. And like you said, all that organization stuff, and people don't talk about that so much. And it's a, a word no. of mouth thing <laughs> a lot of the time. Yeah. Got two books published so far and hoping to get some more, you know, coming off the presses as, as we can get them done. But we're usually editing one at the same time as we're soliciting another one at the same time as we're proofing another one as it's it's a hard it's, road <laughs> yeah we're going to try to get to 10 volumes in all but uh, i think i think we're right now we've got two out and we're working on number five something like that
Excellent. All right. Well, I will link to all of those uh, three things that we've mentioned in the show notes as well. So I better not keep you any longer. We've been chatting so long, but it's just been so interesting. I feel like we could go for about three hours and it's maybe we'll need to do a follow up. I think that would be the best thing. <laughs> Anytime. <laughs> all fun music technology. At some point, I'm, I'm going to attempt to do a um, like a round table sort of discussion with a few of us. It may be a complete disaster, but it could be great. <laughs> So I'm happy to live on the edge and, and give it a go. We can all connect via Zoom or something like that, one of those conferencing systems. But I think that would yeah. be a really great thing to do and, and have a roundtable discussion about some topic or another and it could become a regular thing. Lots of fun. Or it could, or, or it could come to blows. It could come to blows. <laughs> Although I think <laughs> most of us tend to agree about a lot of things. You we know? do. Yeah, we uh, do. Yeah, we only joke about it coming to blows. We and do. Stuff, but, <laughs> we you know, do. You know, the thing is... Uh, with the community that I know of people that are in time and those people that go to conferences and all of those of us that are taking, you know, taking a big uh, step towards advancing music technology. The amazing thing is that we've all come up with the same ideas completely individually. I know. I, I mentioned that in a previous episode. Yeah, I, I had a series of projects that I was doing and then I read, um, I think it maybe first was Scott Watson's book um, and then I read Barb Friedman's book and I'm like, man, we're all doing the same things. And then yours as well, the Making Music with Garage Band and Mixcraft, a lot of those were similar too and I'm thinking – how did we do this? It's like ESP or something. We're all kind of doing yeah. it in our own areas. But they're all – I think it's because they're great projects. You know, they're, they're just interesting, practical projects which are, you know, the creative things and the things that kids love to do. So you're right, absolutely. Yeah, and we're all incredibly passionate about what, what we do because we love seeing the results of it. We love yeah. seeing how this music education inspires our young people. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's just great. It's it's so much fun and you just kind of, kind of got to take that leap of faith and give things a go and, you know, you really reap the rewards in the end. Absolutely. Yeah, I will certainly never regret the day I... I began doing this. It's just wonderful, wonderful stuff. Yeah, I agree. Well, thank you so much, Richard. We will speak very soon and I'll look forward to our next chat. Well, if getting it, uh, if you've got any cricket teams over there that could use a really good leg spinner. <laughs> I'm sure they'd. I think there's a bit of controversy about the whole cricket world at the moment, isn't there? Oh, I don't know. I, I shouldn't even bring it up. I'm not good about talking about these things. I don't know well, enough about them. <laughs> tell them you know this Irish demon over in America that would be willing to, <laughs> to turn his arm over a few times, you know, in the course. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> Sounds good. All right. Thanks so much. Speak soon. All right. Bye-bye. The Music Tech Teacher podcast is hosted by me, Katie Wardrobe. You can find more information and links from today's episode at midnightmusic.com.au forward slash 25. Thanks for listening and I'll see you next time.